Welcome to uh, today's Iris Hep Topical meeting, uh, and we're lucky to be joined today uh, for a talk on uh, the analysis description language uh, and cutlang project. Um, and uh, so we have uh, multiple speakers here today, but um, Cezanne, are you going to be presenting, or is another member of the collaboration going to be? Well, actually, I'm I'm not going to present. Um, oh, okay. So Harrison will introduce everyone, yeah. and then. Oh, okay, fantastic. Then I'll let Harrison yeah. take it away. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Um, so, so, yes. Yeah, so, so thank you. First of all, let me uh, uh, yeah start by thanking you for in, um, inviting us to actually give this presentation. And so what we shall do today is that uh, uh, Goken will start with a present uh, overview of this project. And then that will be followed by uh, Daniel uh, Riley, who is a graduate student at Florida State University. Uh, and uh, then we shall ask um, um, Professor Grigory Djokovic uh, uh, to uh, talk about the sorts of things that we might be able to do uh, by leveraging uh, state of the art compiled technology. Um, and uh, so Grigory is a professor at Florida State University and a computer scientist. And he joined the project a couple of years ago um, to really try to help us to make this uh, a much more sort of a robust um, enterprise. And and then we'll um, just have a discussion. Of course, you know Cezanne and then myself. So we're going to start actually with uh, Ko Ken, who will give a kind of the overview of this project. Uh, so Ko Ken. Um, this will be a brief presentation, 10 minutes, 15 tops, um, just to bring everybody to the same level. Um, obviously, this is a problem that uh, we are trying to solve related to uh, particle physics analysis, um, especially when we have uh, complicated final states that require a lot of computing, chi-square minimization, etc. Uh, traditionally, we solve this kind of problem in uh, using general purpose languages, C++, Python these days, uh, which brings the problem that the physics content and the technical operations are intertwined. We want, wanted to find an alternative that would decouple physics uh, from the technicalities and bring some clarity and accessibility to the analysis logic. We tried to invent this analysis description language as a domain-specific language. We wanted to have an external DSL, not to depend on any other language. We wanted to have a declarative one. Uh, we wanted some easiness for reading, understanding, and we tried to do it, uh, design it for everybody. But of course, we are all uh, physicists, uh, so we did uh, as much as we could. Therefore, we ended up with something which is uh, framework independent. Um, if you write your own framework, then uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, hopefully, we decoupled physics information from the software-related uh, issues, and uh, we tried to make it uh, multi-purpose, um, and we tried to use it for preservation and communication of uh, various analyses. Um, there it is. This is how it looks like these days, as you can see. Um, well, I hope you can also see my cursor. Um, this is um, a simple file uh, where we have some definitions initially, objects. Uh, you take electrons and you produce uh, good electrons by applying some cuts. Then uh, you can make unions, uh, you can define event variables like uh, HD in this case. Then uh, naturally you have different regions, uh, press selection that we call a baseline, and based on the baseline you can define a signal region, a control region, and then uh, you, you run, obviously, your event loop with that. This is also a nice uh, present representation of the analysis logic uh, to see that the good muons are derived from muons and they are used in the definition of good leptons, which are used in signal region and control region. This is sort of an overview of the algorithm. As you saw, uh, this is a plain text file, um, nothing magic. Uh, it is consisting of blocks. Uh, they are separating object variable and event selection definitions. Uh, there is a keyword and instruction structure. Um, the same keyword can be repeated with different instructions. And then the syntax naturally contains mathematical operations, logical operations, comparisons, optimizations, and all the four-vector algebra needed for the high-energy physics specific functions, such as the delta r. On top of this, we also have a library of 
self-containing uh, functions which are non-trivial to define, uh, such as uh, machine learning models or, or complex variables such as the MT2. Uh, about running this um, concept, uh, what do we need? Well, we basically have two paths. Uh, we have a runtime interpreter path and a transpiler slash compiler path. Um, they both started about the same time, but today uh, the interpreter path is a little bit more advanced, and this is the one that I'm going to be talking about. This thing is called Cutlang. Um, it started uh, basically to understand what the students were doing. Um, um, in their C++ code, we shorten it sometimes as a CL. This is a runtime interpreter and a, a framework. Runtime interpreter means there is no compilation. Of course, it is written uh, in C++ and based on root libraries for Lorentz vector operations and histogramming. The parsing is uh, done with the uh, classical tools, Lex and Yak, and the uh, execution is uh, via these uh, double linked lists of function pointers. The framework, as I said, um, is based on root. It can recognize multiple uh, event format, DevFS, open data from Atlas and CMS. Some internal specific format of CMS and Atlas as well are uh, recognized. But of course, there is um, a procedure to add uh, other uh, event formats, uh, and, and this is not very, very difficult to do. Uh, obviously, we have uh, a number of internal functions to cover the necessary functionality. The output itself is a root file, but it contains uh, all the provenance information. Therefore, uh, we can understand by looking at output file what kind of objects were used, what kind of cuts were applied, and the efficiencies, etc. They are all embedded in the root file itself. This is available through Docker, Conda, Jupyter. Therefore, all the uh, Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac machines can run it. Plus uh, the portables via the binder interface. Initially, we focused on um, event processing, uh, and then later on, we added the histograms and visualization. That means uh, we, we, we are more or less able to do a, a selection on simple and composite objects, define event variables, and based on these, do an event selection for the signal control and validation regions. Histogramming, uh, I'm going to say that it is available after our latest uh, editions. Um, one and two dimensional histograms, variable width, and a set of histograms were all added recently. Of course, when, it, when you do real time an analysis, real life analysis, systematic uncertainties become important, and uh, we have added Atlas type uh, syntax that you will see in a moment. Um, we did not do um, more uh, on this, uh, covering uh, statistical uh, significance, statistical inference. This is not yet in the scope. Um, this is a brief reminder of the syntax, uh, what kind of keywords we have, object, region, etc. Uh, we can do select, reject, we can apply weights, histograms, etc. And some operators uh, and not uh, false addition of Lorentz vectors, etc. This is uh, just a reminder. Of, and these are the functions that we have. Obviously, all the mathematics, uh, some reducers, like taking a minimum, maximum, some uh, high energy physics specific functions, such as delta R. And then you can obviously combine objects or, or uh, do a union between objects. Um, this is the Atlas uh, specific uh, systematics that I had promised. Um, up and down type systematics are embedded into the Atlas antiples uh, with a proper uh, in their proper branches. Therefore, this is available now uh, and, and uh, it is being used. In two different analyses in Atlas that we have been doing within the exotics group, one for searching for vector-like quarks and the other one for vector-like leptons. We also published a couple of years ago a phenomenology study uh, for the FCC and uh, HLLHC. Um, we are also focusing on the uh, analysis of the open data. Uh, I will cover this in uh, other slides. There is some link. Uh, this is for designing new analyses. Uh, we have also started uh, looking for the existing analyses to make a database. Um, we have of the order of tens or, or 20-ish uh, analyses which are sometimes validated and put in this repository and some drafts which are not yet validated here. 
the validation that uh, the validation path that we have selected is uh, called the EM uh, creator. Uh, this is a Monte Carlo generator plus a detector simulation and then ADLCL setup uh, to run the analysis. And obviously, we need some tool to uh, set uh, limits since uh, well. Um, the, for the interpretation studies, uh, we have been uh, joining forces with this models group. Uh, I will discuss that later. Um, and uh, we have been trying to understand what we can do for the long-term analysis uh, preservation, which is here. Um, for the interpretation and preservation, uh, we wanted to have a clear description of the complete analysis logic. Um, and, and, and maybe ADL and CutLang would, would help in, in this uh, by putting the data counts, background estimates, signal predictions into the file itself so that we can do a direct comparison between the output of a paper, for example, and, and what we obtain uh, from, from CutLang. Uh, eventually, we can put all this information into a generic place like uh, HEP data uh, to keep it for, well, later use. Open data is uh, relatively new. Uh, we have set up an example uh, only this um, summer for the CMS Open Data Workshop, starting an existing study uh, for the TT bar analysis and re-optimizing it for the uh, vector-like top quark uh, signal. Uh, there is this link on how to do this. Uh, previous uh, year, in 2022, we had also an exercise uh, it was a re-implementation of a previous analysis with uh, vector-like quarks. Uh, just to show you that we have the necessary tools to produce nice histograms. Latest developments, obviously, these days, uh, ChatGPT version 4 is very hype. Uh, I'm going to show something about that. Uh, we can use it either to generate an analysis quickly, or at least the skeleton quickly, or maybe start from the analysis itself and start the skeleton of a paper. Neural network models can now be executed through these uh, Onyx files, which seem to be one of the, at least one of the uh, common formats. Uh, we can now access the, all the variables in the interpol uh, directly without any need for coding. Um, as a physicist, I have learned very recently the idea of having a Levenstein distance. Uh, now we can guesstimate the variable names based on user input. This is fantastic for me. Uh, we have added uh, lots of things, speed optimization, uh, jet constituents, uh, bitwise operations, delta function, etc. Oh, this is an example here on how to uh, run a neural network based on uh, set of variables defined here and then the model in onyx format is presented here and then this is the model executor okay here's the interesting thing for me um go is myself i'm saying to the tool uh, to to jet gpt that it should select events with two jets two muons make a z make a w ta -da 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 -da, and it gives me um, after some training of course that you don't see here um, the um, analysis correctly, uh, believe it or not, in, in ADL. Okay, so far, uh, what have you seen? You have seen some tool, uh, maybe a library, uh, to define a single analysis in a clear and organized way. It also provides some library functions, um, which we think are bug-free as much as we can. Okay, this is sort of a... Uh, what you see is what you get, or what you get is what you see type of analysis, guaranteeing things like no double counting, correct sorting, chi-square, minimization, correctness, etc. But its true power relies in the, in the hope that we can apply this in the multi-analysis landscape. When you have multiple analyses, what happens? Then you can ask questions like, which final states did the existing analyses look at? Which final states are unexplored? How much overlap between this analysis and that analysis? Then, uh, for a particular analysis, if we can, we can build graphs and tables to understand, to visualize, as you have seen before. Or you can query, for example, the objects. Uh, for example, what kind of muons are used? What kind of isolation is included? Then you can also query the analyses. What kind of analyses are using missing information with a cut on, on about 300, let's say. Uh, 
then you can start comparing and combining analysis and uh, interesting things uh, will come out of that we, we predict. Anyway, to do these things, uh, the existing setup, uh, well, it has its own limitations because it has been developed by physicists. We need true uh, computer scientists to help us uh, on how to advance these. And at that point, I'm going to give the word uh, to my young colleague, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Kekan. Um, yes, so, so Daniel was a, was a graduate student at Florida State, a uh, student of uh, Professor Fedjokovic, uh, will actually talk about uh, some of the work that he's been doing to actually uh, try to, uh, to put into place, you know, um, um, uh, technology that allows them to uh, actually build some of the things that we still think are needed uh, for this project. So please, uh, Daniel, if we could uh, continue. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, uh, yeah, we um, started this uh, new design um, with sort of a modular uh, approach. So um, this new parsing system for ADL was uh, developed with that modularity in mind. And the reason is that uh, this makes it easier for future changes to uh, be integrated. Um, so in the new in the new parser, um, we simplified what the grammar is responsible for, uh, leaving it only to catch uh, obvious syntax errors, and then for building an intermediate representation of the ADL file uh, in the form of an abstract syntax tree. If you're familiar with uh, building compilers, you may be familiar with uh, an AST, an abstract syntax tree. Um, so after parsing is completed, uh, then we use this uh, AST to perform our remaining checks. And those tasks are each a, a single pass over the AST um, where we might check for uh, typing, we check for declare before use uh, errors and various other uh, semantic checks. What's nice about this design is that we can add features in the future uh, by writing a traversal over the AST, and we don't have to go back and uh, rebuild uh, the previous parts of, uh, of the process. So currently, we walk uh, through the AST for correctness checks, um, but we can also use this design uh, to build diagnostic tools. Um, a near-term goal we have uh, then is to build in logic checks for coherence between selections made in objects uh, that take from another object, um, and similarly with regions. So uh, the, the AST is constructed such that each ADL block is a node in the AST. So the top node there is a, an object node. Um, and then uh, each block contains a, a tree that encodes the information, the selections made within the object of the region block. And then, of course, we have um, a node for definitions as well. Uh, the name of the object and the selection statements, like I just said, uh, are uh, that are made in the object are shown here in this uh, graphic um, where each of the statements uh, is included um, sort of in this tree-like structure. Um, then each block uh, for the AST is um, set up in a vector. So uh, this makes, this is really nice because uh, having this sort of flat con construction uh, means that a walk through the AST um, amounts to just crawling through the vector from front to back um, and then probing at each node uh, probing the the tree beneath, and we can we can uh, systematically gather um, the important information, make make changes um, as they as they need to be made, catch errors, this kind of thing. Um, so this design is cheap for each traversal of the AST, meaning that uh, as we add new features, uh, these many walks through the AST um, are not so costly on the runtime of the tool. Um, yeah, so, and as I said before, uh, this means that we can perform many checks 
over an ADL file through the uh, AST um, and build features without interfering with uh, previous checks. Um, and then also we, we can utilize the AST uh, for on the fly creation of uh, some helpful diagnostic tools. So one sort of tool that we've uh, implemented uh, and actually has been used a few times um, by the team is this uh, automatic creation of a so-called flowchart. And this flowchart is uh, a helpful visual representation of the relationships between objects and regions in an analysis. Uh, Goken showed a small one earlier. This was the uh, red, green, and blue boxes uh, before, and I've got an example coming. So this is very helpful for catching uh, missing object and region dependency, or perhaps finding links uh, between objects and regions uh, that were not intended. Um, this isn't the only sort of diagnostic tool that uh, we have currently, uh, but we can also uh, make a nice printout of the AST. It stands for reason. If we walk through the AST, we can we can print it, right? And uh, this is uh, very helpful, uh, maybe not for physicists, but uh, helpful for developers um, to create this visual um, so that when new features are added, we can, uh, this is a way to uh, check for the uh, correctness of the AST. Uh, in the future, we... Uh, intend to be able to uh, generate tables uh, from data and an analysis uh, in a similar manner. So uh, as I said, here's an example of a flowchart. Um, this was automatically generated rather than done by hand. Um, and you can see the similarity between uh, this one and uh, the small example we, we saw before. Um, this example is um, quite uh, illustrative uh, because it this comes from a, a real life example, um, and then as I said, we've uh, used this new uh, automatic generating uh, tool to build um, flowcharts for new, uh, newly written examples. So that's uh, been been pretty cool to see. Um, so one of the main goals for the development of the new parsing system was to simplify the grammar in a way that removed particle and attribute and function names from, uh, yeah, directly from the grammar. Um, and what we've done is instead, these things are referenced uh, in a library that's external to the parser. So the parser collects the information from the ADL file, puts it, uh, makes it this intermediate representation, the AST, and then uh, over some passes over this AST, uh, we can connect the um, various pieces um, from the ADL file it, it, to, the, uh, to these external libraries to uh, match up particle names and attributes and functions and make sure that these are valid requests, if you like. Um, and this is very helpful because, uh, well, as you may know, if you've if you've worked with um, these tools before, so specifically we use um, um, Bison or Yak uh, for the, for the grammar. Um, when you start making changes to the grammar, things can get uh, hairy pretty fast if if you're not careful. Um, and so the external libraries make it very easy to add some new attribute or function. Um, without having to uh, dig so much into the core code of the system. Uh, so currently we have um, functions compiled with the code, but uh, in the future, what we would like is um, for functions, that, that not just the names um, and, and the parameter list, but all the, for the de definition of the function, to be uh, in a pre-compiled library. Um, and that, that would just add, make linking to new functions or you know you want to implement a new uh, a new function, uh, you won't have to compile the whole 
uh, core code, you can just link to, you just compile that function and to put it into this pre-compiled library and, uh, and then off you go. Uh, we have some other big uh, future plans in the works. Um, so one of the things that uh, we I, I briefly mentioned before is uh, we it'd be useful to make uh, logic checks between objects that take from another object. We can use um, logic tools to automate this. Um, similarly, uh, region coherence uh, can be checked and uh, we can use this same idea um, to help us do something that I think would be very impactful for um, future uh, future experiments, which is this uh, automation of um, re uh, an analysis of uh, regions which are to check to see if they're disjoint or non-disjoint. Um, so this, maybe um, Harrison uh, can jump in here uh, just to, he, he gives a very good uh, um, impassioned explanation of why this is so, so important, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best uh, here, which is this uh, problem of choosing um, or, or being able to tell whether two regions in an analysis are uh, disjoint um, is is very important because uh, if two regions are uh, are disjoint, then we they can be combined into an analysis. Uh, but if there's some overlap, then there th those regions cannot just be directly uh, directly um, used uh, combined for for the same analysis and. This is a, a big problem because um, these things can get quite complicated, and uh, I I understand that this then to be able to decide whether or not um, or where this overlap comes from can take weeks or months or sometimes longer um, in work just to manually check for this overlap between between regions. And uh, so this is this is what's shown here on on this this slide. Um, so what needs to happen is on, on the right hand side there needs to be some discovery of uh, this uh, region C, the yellow region, um, picking out the pieces of data that are in this overlap, so that uh, then the remaining data can be used in an analysis. Uh, Harrison, was there anything you would like to add to that? No, I think you've done a good job. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, we believe that uh, since the, we believe that uh, we can help with this um, uh, problem in the current um, uh, architecture of the new system, and what we intend to do is apply logic solvers to to help with this problem. So there's going to be challenge to, challenges to this. It will require some more research. Um, but the main idea revolves around um, the selections in each region um, boiling down to a conjunction of Boolean statements. Then we can take a, if we can encode those uh, logic statements and translate them over into something that a logic solver can understand, then uh, we can take the conjunction from each of these two regions that we're making a comparison of, um, can join those two and uh, and then make a check for uh, the formula's satisfiability. Um, if the solver reports that the conjunction is unsatisfiable, meaning that there's no assignment to the variables such that the whole big formula is true, um, then we can reason that the, the two regions are disjoint. Um, but if the, if, if it, the other case uh, happens where the region selections are satisfiable, then uh, it could be that there's an overlap in the regions. So what's more is we think that uh, because of the information in the case that a uh, solver returns uh, that a formula is satisfiable, um, we think that uh, we can, because then this solver will return as a model that says that gives us some information on all of these variables, then uh, 
we can use that model for clues as to where this overlap uh, is is happening. Um, so the plan is to have the first version of this feature uh, work on only a single multi-region ADL file for ver for these checks. Um, but the the dream is uh, to have this work over many ADL files and make an analysis over the regions in, in each of them. And if we could do this, it would be pretty impactful, I think. So I mentioned um, I, I, logic solvers and satisfiability, unsatisfiability. And to give more detail on these uh, logic solvers and, and how we can use them, um, I'll pass the, the torch to my major professor, Dr. Grigory Fedykovich. Thank yes. You, Thank you, Daniel. Um, right. So I'm not a not only the uh, experienced and knowledgeable person in um, languages and uh, compilers. I my main discipline is actually oops. Yeah, my main, main discipline is actually studying uh, correctness of different programs in different programming languages and logic that uh, the, the buzzword that Daniel mentioned multiple times in the last 10 minutes is, is really the driver. It's considered to be calculus in many applications, many domains in computer science nowadays. So uh, whenever you have to solve a computational task, such as the task of finding these joint non joint regions, this is where you can have an external tool to be built by a specific group of people in this computer science, under the computer science, and uh, rely on the output of that tool, the logic tool, logic solver, in order to solve, uh, or at least like to semi solve some, give some important insights about uh, this particular problem. So it's really lives in the mathematics. So, how the solvers work, they follow mathematical rules. It's not like Chat GPT that can give you a likelihood, likely uh, valid solution, but it doesn't give you 100% guarantee. It's just very strict mathematical reasoning. If, if it tells you yes, this joint, then it's 100% you join. And uh, in what what I'm doing uh, in for my in my research, I'm just applying this logic solvers everywhere, any in, where any find as many applications of these new tools where um, there's a need for that. So there are multiple algorithms. They're becoming more practical. They are driven by heuristics. They are um, they heavily rely on like ethnography, uh, which is like um, activity by learning how different people use different tools. And yeah, so that gives us ideas how algorithms can be can be constructed. And we also can trust the solutions because there's not a single tool, not a single logic solver, but there are many. And if you, yeah, of course, they are also written by humans and there could be like the, there's some bugs introduced Unintentionally in because in this tool in this tool, but if you if you don't trust it or if you want to double check, you just take another solver and you can use this another solver for revalidation of that result. So, uh, what is correctness? Uh, correctness is relative. Uh, if you just took took a look at program written in any language that you may or ADL or C or C plus plus you often cannot really tell what is correct and what is not, just because uh, you, need to, you need to know with respect to which specification, with respect to which property you want to check that correctness. And uh, typically we go over like specific properties like disjoint, non-disjoint regions, coherence regions or this kind of stuff, or even type checking or termination so it never gets stuck. And by saying that, well, a piece of code is correct, independently on what language is, is, is being used, is if that property holds or not. Importantly, in order to prove correctness, we do not need to run, we don't need to execute these programs. We actually, by saying we why do we need by saying that we need to invest in building a compiler or interpreter, it doesn't really mean that 
compilation and regression is the only thing that these compilers should do. No, they also can be used to check correctness. They can also be used in order to encode the specific pieces of code that we are interested in in logic formulas and solve this logic formulas. All right. Uh, this is like a slide from your undergrad from the like discrete math, just to remind you what, what it is. And we are really based on this Boolean expressions, Boolean operators, logical conjunction, disjunction, negations, and or not respectively. And uh, we're solving tasks for the called disability. So the disability intuitively means that having a formula, having a set of variables, is it in principle possible to evaluate the whole formula to true if you find assignments to each of these variables, substitute and apply these mathematical rules? Uh, yeah, so this is like an example, very, very small example with four variables, X, Y, Z, and W. So they are used in some conjun conjunctions, disjunctions, etc. And if you just substitute X, Y, W by true and Z by false, then you will see that the whole formula is, is true. Um, yeah, sounds very easy, but in reality, there could be millions of variables in the formula. And can you just imagine how many combinations this logic solvers have to do, have to have to have to scan in order to find the solution? Oh, even from in the 60s, it was uh, Discover that in the worst case scenario, you just need to you just need to enumerate all possible satisfying assignments, which makes this problem very hard in theory. However, these days, uh, there, as I mentioned, there are many practical solutions, practical uh, applications, and uh, yes, we still uh, bet in terms of solving some theoretically difficult uh, problems, but practical problems that arise from actual applications. We, this, this is something we can solve really efficiently. This is just an example. This is an experiment made uh, like by my colleagues uh, in Rice University in Houston. Uh, they just try to evaluate the, how, how the, the, the performance of solvers evolved over the like, last 20 years. So they took the first solver from 2000 and uh, they took several other solvers from like, 2004, 7, 12. And it was, uh, ex this experiment was done not, not actually uh, already like, 10 years ago. Uh, and they, they take the same machine, they take the same problem and just try to be exactly the same environment. And they just try to run these tools and see how uh, how much better the current sol solvers behave in, on exactly the same problem. And we see that something which used to be solved in like thousands of seconds, now it's solved in one second, it's algorithmic scale. So of course, these days it's even, even faster and uh, there are multiple like dozens of solvers that have been maintained uh, every, uh, well, day, <laughs> day or not, day, it's not, not important, but being maintained currently and they are designed to solve these problems quicker and quicker. Uh, for disjoints, disjoint uh, regions and disjoint regions, we need to uh, rely on tools that are based on theoretic theories. Like theory by theory, I mean just add extra, let's say, typing of the of the of, of variables. Not only rely on Boolean variables, but also like integers, reals, maybe arrays. Uh, like some some data structures and so on and so forth. So this logical framework allows us to sort of go to richer richer settings, try and and solve conceptually the same problems. If uh, a formula has has a solution, if there is, if there is an assignment to variables that validate the formula or not. So this is called uh, SMT, but you probably don't really need this these details. Uh, and the similar picture, uh, there would be a similar picture on this SMT solvers as well. So it gets more and more, uh, more faster and faster every year. One important point here is that, as you can see, this uh, improvement does not depend on architectural advances of machines. Uh, because the same machine was used here in this experiment. And of course, you can also parallelize. You, of course, you can also exploit you know, uh, some distributed, distributed, pro, distributed um, settings like uh, cloud processing and so on and so forth. 
So that will make this reasoning even faster. All right, so uh, I hope I gave you um, some overview of this discipline and uh, with all of that, that, I think we are ready to summer to, to give summary and I guess uh, Harrison, right? Or Susan? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gregor. Well, that was actually very, very clear. Yes. Yeah, so, so to, to, to summarize, uh, you know, ADL, you know, is a is a form defined um, language. It's very much independent. What we mean by that is that it doesn't depend on particular software analysis framework. Um, and, and in fact, it, it's a design so that it can be uh, actually embedded in whatever framework you wish. Um, and as was explained by Gorkan, uh, one of one of the goals, of which there are many, uh, is using this language to actually preserve LHC analysis, you know, well into the future, um, and essentially even beyond the time when you know frameworks may become obsolete. Uh, the language is executable uh, either through direct runtime interpretation, uh, as was described by uh, Gorkan. Uh, Did we lose Harrison? Uh, I think uh, so. Later, through source-to-source oh. -source compilation um, from ADL to some target language like C++ or Python, that's something that uh, we, with the technologies being built, uh, will be actually possible to, to be done in a sort of automated way. And in fact, as was described by uh, Daniel, that we have now uh, several state-of-the-art uh, compiler tools uh, that recently developed. Uh, and in fact, uh, Cutlang uh, has been re-engineered and, and is being re-engineered to actually use them. And this has made a, a considerable improvement in the performance of, uh, of various uh, aspects of that interpreter. Now, these tools and others that uh, are needed, um, for example, Of course, you know, once you have a language like this, of, of which we have sort of control, uh, there are many things that potentially one can do, uh, such as uh, automating the, the the finding of uh, of the overlap regions or disjoint uh, uh, um, regions, as was described uh, by both uh, Daniel and uh, and Grigory. And but of course, this is a research problem, right? And so we plan to actually uh, uh, embark on a program um, to Try to understand how these formal language verification systems, solvers, uh, can be used in sort of real world analysis problems, such as the one uh, that was described by Daniel, um, and where possible, actually implement solutions. Uh, that's something that's very important, and uh, that's work that, uh, that's yet to be done. And we are looking forward very much to find areas of uh, collaboration with Iris Hat uh, community, and in fact, other communities within within particle physics. Uh, and of course, the hope is, is that the research on the use of these uh, solvers for our specific domain will also have applications in other domains. And so that's really that's really the goal. So again, uh, thank you uh, for your attention uh, questions. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, and yeah, so we'll go um, to, to to chat to see. Uh, okay, it looks like we already have one question from Alex, so I'll go ahead and let him uh, uh, get ask that. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, there's a lot of interesting um, work going on here, I think. Um, I have a question, well, I have a number of questions actually. Let me start with one that sort of like goes to like mapping this to the reality. In the way that you sort of talk about this, it seems like there's like a thing such as a jet, and uh, that jet then has some properties, but a jet is a jet is a jet in all the analyses for which you need to evaluate overlap. The reality of the situation now in Atlas is that what makes the jet is going to depend on what, when in time I look at it, because there might be calibrations that will change the picture. It will depend on what kind of overlap removal scheme I'm applying, because maybe my jet then becomes another object. And uh, it depends on the delta R that I set for the jet. It depends on the jet collection. Like there's a ton of details that are somehow still in there. And if you want to do the overlap um, quantification 
uh, correctly that all kind of would have to enter. Is this just like something that is assumed to be sort of like jets is a jet is sort of close enough? Or how would you see this uh, enter? May I take this? Yes, please go ahead, Susan. Okay, yeah, very good point. Um, actually, the way we see ADL is as a map from the input that we have, uh, whatever format the input is, to an analysis output. So all these things that you mentioned, different jet collections, uh, overlap removal, all sorts of corrections and so on, are in principle supposed to be implemented in ADL. So if you have two different jet collections that you work with, you would be able to address them with their name uh, as is in the input file, and you should be able to access them directly. And then you should be able to apply the corrections that you want. You should be able to do overlap removal. Actually, we do that in uh, some analysis examples that we've implemented. It's just that in the examples we showed here, we had to take very short uh, examples uh, to be able to give a, an overview of how the language looks. So, so does that mean that all analyses would have to start from the same sort of primal objects in practice? No, 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 mean? not at all, not at all. Whatever you want. I mean, you, if if you wanted, you could start from I don't know. Uh, in CMS, we call them particle flow objects to to make a jet, or you can start from different jet collections. It's just that uh, it depends on the input file that you have. I mean, you can start from an Atlas file, you can start from a, a CMS file, you can start from the object that the input file has. It's just that you have to, but, yeah. but but you're you're starting from the same common input. So in CMS, say you start from like a nano EOD file, anything in your analysis following this file would go into ADL. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. I mean you. Okay. All nano AOD content would be accessible by ADL, but you could use a different end tuple as well. So that's that's a non-issue. You have to if, use if I could actually, Yeah, if I could actually add to, I mean, one of course difficulty that that we we foresee is that you know we really like to, I say. Sorry, your hands of analyses. Okay. You know, uh, yeah, Harrison, your your audio system seems to choose the perfect words to cut out. It's like the you know the uh, meat of your oh answer dear. gets dropped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me see if I can find something. something no, just better. just it, it seems random. So just uh, just repeat okay. it, and hopefully yeah. it'll randomly pick a different part of the sentence, and and we'll we'll be able to okay. piece it together. Okay. So one of the issues that we anticipate is that. Uh, let's suppose you have two ADL analyses, and in, in fact, they are using exactly the same objects, but for reasons unknown, they're using different uh, names for the attributes of these objects. But let's suppose that actually can happen. Uh, one of the issues then, of course, is, is how does one, if, if one's trying to determine overlaps between two different ADL, you know, analysis written ADL, how does one identify that, that, that these two objects in these two analyses are in fact the same, even if superficially they look different. So, so the, what we are hoping is that by building this compiler technology, um, it will make that task at least potentially one that can be solved automatically. But that remains to be seen as part of the research we wish to do. Right, yeah, I, I see how this would like, technically be doable. The, the sort of concern I have is that it sounds like you're effectively trying to cover all of physics analysis, which like an end user would write code for, which is going to be in practice many thousands of lines of code, many of which are custom per analysis that all need to be like mapped into this. And I, I see how you can fairly easily cover a huge fraction of that. But I don't see how you can cover all of this without being able to handle custom code that users are like uh, can in, in input. I don't know to what extent that works in the current system. And I feel like as soon as you have to support that, you kind of break this assumption that you can in principle solve everything. So as as is true of all computer languages, um, it's a question of degree, right? Uh, 
so as as you know, in every language there is there is a sort of a partition that is made between things that are intrinsic to the language and 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 only the language is required to describe them, and things that in principle you could code within a language, but it's it it's more practical to to code it somewhere else and then have a library that can be uh, drawn from. Uh, I mean, an example of that, of course, is the use of machine learning, right? This is something that absolutely uh, we have to take into account because that's now being used everywhere. Um, it would simply be not feasible to, to encode such things within this language. Uh, however, there are methods by which one can actually access uh, these models um, and so I, I think, it, yeah, I mean, this is, this is in design of any of these systems, any of these languages, uh, one has to make a choice as to where is the boundary. Um, and, and this is one reason why we, we welcome collaboration uh, to make sure. Uh, Harrison, unfortunately, okay, sorry, cut out cut again out just again. after the word collaboration. So it, it, okay, in my I'm, view, I'm going yeah. to try. Let me let me try a different. Uh, let me try a different um, piece of technology. Let me just, one second. Okay. Sure. Uh, I can, Go I ahead, can briefly say, like, yeah, in, in my view here, effectively, like, there's two ways of going about this. You effectively either you pr uh, provide something that's Turing complete, yeah. and then sure, yeah, everyone can, can do can anything. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Is that better? I hope. Right now, it's stable. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, it, it, I mean, it's a very important point, right, is, is where does one put the boundary between external functions uh, and, 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 and things that can be completely described within the language? Uh, we, we think we've found roughly the right boundary, but it, it's something that we need, of course, uh, more community uh, involvement to make sure that the boundary that we've chosen is correct. So, so where exactly is this boundary? I don't think I got that. Well, so, so I mean, your your, your point, as I, if I understood correctly, is that well, as soon as you start uh, allowing custom code, let's just say there's something very very complicated, it would just be too, it would just simply be inconvenient to describe within this language. Uh, it is then delegated to some external library, some custom code that has to be uh, that has to be imported, and. And of course, the concern is that, well, how do you prevent someone from basically going back to doing things the traditional way where everything's done in some external code and there's just one call from the ADL? I, I mean, this is a legitimate concern. That is true. Uh, the, the, the hope is that by, by, by having, so far, you know, this has been developed by a small team of people. Of course, we've, we've sought a lot of feedback from people who are actually uh, using this. But we want to understand uh, where does something that can written in ADL begin, and where does and 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 where do we delegate things to external functions? And I give well, as an example machine learning. It is obviously true that this it makes no sense whatsoever, and in fact cannot be done really to describe these things within ADL, and and, and so there one is necessarily going to use external functions. And, and the only question is, uh, well, once you've done that, then of course, in principle, you should allow any external function uh, should be callable from ADL. But of course, there's always the danger that someone basically puts more and more and more into an external function and less and less into ADL, which then of course defeats the, the, the whole purpose of having something that makes explicit the analysis uh, logic. But again, it's something that we have to see when we deploy this uh, in practice, but uh, but your concern is 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 is, is well, yeah, we we understand that. Again, continue, uh, Alex. More questions. Yeah, I have a different one, but I talked a lot, so I wanted to give someone else the opportunity if anyone else has something. Alex, do you have more questions? Um, so, you have several. so yeah, I'm just checking real quick to look at the. The list, it, it doesn't seem that anyone does. I, I think I have a quick one. Well, I, I also have several, but maybe I can sneak in a quick one that I think will probably be a 30 second answer and then we can go back to Alex. Um, so I think it was on slide five, maybe in the original presentation. Um, the 
the description of the uh, ADL spec that is actually then given to Cutlang, it was described as just being uh, plain text, but and from the looks of it, it really is like just a like just dot txt and not like a something like json or yaml so is is that true is this really just like a text file and if so then how do you go about doing uh spec validation uh beforehand and i guess what was the choice for dot txt over something with a structure so yeah, please. Please, Seth, uh, maybe you can answer that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really a text file. I mean, we call it .adl actually, but uh, but that's it. And uh, the validation, uh, well, uh, by if by spec validation, what you mean is you know a syntax validation that happens within the uh, the parser interpreter. Um, as we see, uh, we, but but more formal validation tools are uh, going to be developed by Daniel and Gregory's work. Uh, but yeah, so so we didn't want to choose JSON or YAML or anything else. We wanted to choose a, a text file or really you know this simple description. But this thing can be converted to any other uh, any other format. I mean, this can be converted to JSON, to YAML, to C plus plus, to to whatever you want. So that's well, why we want to have an independent uh, description. When you say that it, it can be converted, you mean that you've written interp like uh, uh, no, 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 no. We, or... we we have not yet. But in principle, with the parser structure we have, I mean Daniel or Gregory can uh, answer this better. But uh, it can be uh, in principle converted. It yes. cannot right now, today, but tomorrow it can. Yeah, that, that's definitely one of the one of the the, the, the goals is to actually build these uh, so-called transpilers, uh, source to source compilers, uh, using the technology that uh, uh, that, that uh, Daniel and uh, uh, Dr. Fajukovic uh, are developing. Uh, and and once once we have these source to source compilers, then one can imagine several things. So, for example, supposing you, you're fond of uh, working in Rivet, for example, right? One can imagine a source to source compiler. Whose output uh, is is in fact a, a rivet uh, rivet analysis that plugs in directly into rivet, or if you basically you're interested in using R data frame, for example, one can imagine again a source source compiler whose output is uh, is a something that uses R data frame and so on. So that's kind of the vision that we that we imagine that we have something that is that is uh, whose whose syntax we hope is 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 one that uh, most physicists would be able to read. And it form and it actually forms a documentation for the analysis, uh, but it doesn't preclude uh, mapping this to to uh, uh, existing frameworks and frameworks that yet to be written. But uh, Alex, let's go back to you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I had one more question. Like, how you see users interacting with this? My kind of impression is that, in principle, users should start developing their analysis by writing it down in ADL and then effectively use something like Cutlang uh, to evaluate all of this. With this said, I'm assuming Cutlang is sort of like acting as a reference implementation here. I don't know if there's others. And that brings me then to the question of um, how much there is um, work spe specifically done for performance, for distributed execution, for efficient scaling, because um, doing the full analysis will take I don't know, uh, like a suitable number of CPUs to be efficient. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. what has happened in that regard. Yeah, maybe I can also take the first part and Gökhan can take the second. So regarding the user interaction, I mean, yeah, of course, users would be welcome to attempt a full analysis with this infrastructure. But the way I see this personally is that this infrastructure um, comes out quite handy in the initial design phase of an analysis. Uh, uh, most specifically, cut optimization. I've done this. I mean, Gökhan is doing full Atlas analysis with the, with this setup. 
Um, but even when preparing a simple open data example, I prepared many, many ADL files with different cut, uh, cuts, you know, event selections, and I was able to document them very easily. I was able to play around with things, you know, create alternative ways of running an analysis and compare the results in a very nicely self-documenting way. So this, we think, is, is a very advantageous uh, thing that ADL can, brings in, can bring into analysis design. Once again, the users can can use this for you know really doing their full scale analysis. But of course, this is not a must. And then, uh, when an analysis is is finished, um, you know it it would be a nice thing if we would have ADL implementations of, of the analysis so that people can communicate and and preserve the physics content of the analysis. And then that uh, full analysis implementation can be simplified to serve in reinterpretation studies. So that's the way I envision it. Um, others can comment. And Gökhan has done some performance studies, maybe he can comment uh, a bit on those. Oh, yes, uh, actually these two Atlas exotic uh, analyses, uh, one about vector-like quarks and the other one vector-like leptons, they are all both implemented uh, with ADL and are being executed through CutLang. But for the vector-like quark analysis, we also have the pure C++ version for comparison. Um, recently, uh, and obviously the pure C++ version is more optimized and runs faster. But how much faster? Or how much uh, is the ADL cut line version is slower? Uh, recently, we have done through some optimization campaign and I can say that including um, an analysis with four different uh, chi-square minimization uh, which is the most uh, time-consuming part is only 20 percent or so slower than the C++ version. Um, but on the other hand CPU time these days is not too difficult to obtain. Um, CPU, in a sense, is abundant. You use your local farm, um, you use your, your, your grid account. Um, I, I think I see it as, as the following. This physicist time, physicist resource is more important. That has two aspects. When my students come in they, and they present me something, um, I, need, I need to understand exactly what they have been doing. If it happened uh, to me that in the C++ code they were applying some, some cuts and in the printout they were doing something totally different. Um, with this approach, you won't get that. You will get exactly what you see. And, and secondly, um, <laughs> when you end up uh, with a file uh, that was created like a week ago and your student tells you, well, I don't remember exactly with what version uh, I have executed this, I go, I need to go back and check it out, etc. Um, this is rather time consuming. Uh, again, with this approach, you can avoid that problem. Um, therefore, I believe we might be losing... Uh, sorry, on... sorry, Gökhan, one, one, one detail to add. I mean, one can do this because the, the ADL file that's used for running the analysis is um, also recorded in the in the output root file when you get uh, when you run Catlang. Yes, I had mentioned that during the presentation. Um, okay, so in a sense, we might lose uh, from uh, CPU uh, point of view, but then I believe we are gaining from a physicist point of view. Now, concerning tools to use. Um, distributing events, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we can do that. We have developed some minimal version of uh, job submission using the local uh, uh, farm and, and multi-core machines, etc. that we have. But of course, more, more work is needed. Uh, as I keep saying, these are semi-professional approaches. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I agree with your point that it's important to uh, keep in mind the time that the people running all of this also spend. Uh, and yeah, I, I think we can't neglect the view time, but if there's a 20% overhead, that's actually not that large. So like, that actually sounds surprisingly good to me. 
Um, I think we lost our host. I have one other question. Um, yes. I don't know if anyone is taking over the like uh, sharing app, but no, one thing I'm wondering. Uh, you mentioned thanks. Uh, you mentioned systematics, um, and you mentioned that like you have an example for Atlas. Uh, can you send me? I'm, I'm assuming this is all internal, Atlas internal. But uh, can you send me how exactly that looks like in practice? I'm very curious how you handle systematics. Um, there was there was one slide about it. Uh, says I think you mentioned on slide eight or something like this. Yeah, could you please go down? Thank you. Stop here, please. Uh, as you can see in the ADL file, uh, the sentence, uh, the line starts with the keyword systematic. Then you have the possibility to turn it on or off. Then you give the name of the systematic up, systematic down. And then you have the possibility of giving um, the branch, the name of the branch in which you can find uh, this information. If it is a weight, then uh, you call it weight uh, lepton scale factor, for example. But sometimes it is not only weight. You, you also have uh, full trees that contain these systematic variations. Maybe um, you would recognize things like, well, let me read, mion ID up, uh, mion ID down, or uh, mion scale up, mion scale down. And then the relevant keyword to give here is tree. Uh, ah, okay. Then, I didn't appreciate. So in the file, it looks like this, and then effectively the interpreter figures out where there exist variations for any given quantity, and automatically exactly, those. exactly. Okay. Now, now look at the screenshots in the middle of the presentation. Among, apart from the nominal tree, uh, in the anthropole there is a mion scale down and mion scale up uh, tree from which you can read the information. If it is not in the tree, but a simple scaling. Then in the uh, nominal, you will find, or whatever your Antipole uh, uh, nominal uh, tree name is, we, the relevant weights, uh, as you can see in the upper uh, screenshot um, segment, uh, such as the pile up up and pile up down. These are all weights. OK, no, then, then I get this. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah this, this not sure, well, of course, across, uh, this standard atlas. The setup that we have. Of course, with CMS, things are a bit more complicated and uh, we haven't attacked that problem yet. Yeah, yeah. Systematics is still, you know, just made to fit Atlas right now so that we have a temporary solution. We will work it, towards yeah, a Yeah, in, in Atlas, solution. they'll they'll also change, I think, moving forward. But okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we really need that. Actually, this was, there was a discussion that started in last year's uh, Analysis Ecosystems Workshop meeting for a community standard well, will also be following yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we, we're out of time, actually. And so, um, in fact, we're over time. So if there is just one brief question, uh, Jerry, please. Uh, hi. Uh, I just have a quick question on the uh, transpiler idea, I guess. Um, yes. Have you thought about or explored idea where you start from a uh, kind of like imperative language with AST or Marco support and then kind of just implement the most commonly uh, abstractable operations into a DSL? So, um, that way, I guess you naturally get the AST because you have a real language AST, and then also you don't worry about transpiling because you are generating the legal code of the whole language. Thought about um, sorry, Jerry. Just like me, I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're cutting out somewhat, so it's not completely clear. But, but what I can tell you, let, let me say what 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 was done as a, as as really as a proof of principle. A very again built by physicists. We we actually did build a a, a transpiler that went from ADL to C plus plus just just to confirm that this was a feasible thing. But this was done. You know, not using any of these uh, of these tools um, uh, that there's a there's a now currently exists, and so the 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 goal is to actually uh, make use of the uh, of the intermediate representation that Daniel uh, has been working on, um, and and then what and, and then use that to actually build uh, mappings from ADL to to essentially whatever whatever target language uh, you, you wish. And, and and so one of the things that uh, that um, 
we would like to uh, implement is a mapping from ADL to uh, those people who are using the so-called um, um, columnar analysis approaches uh, as, a, as, a, again, as, as a proof that such a mapping can be performed. And what our computer scientist colleagues are telling us, uh, 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 Grigory and, and Daniel, is that yes, with, with this technology, uh, this becomes completely feasible. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I think we should uh, we should call the meeting to a close. Again, I just want to thank uh, uh, the uh, Iris Hep for inviting us to uh, make this presentation, and I'm we're very very grateful also for the uh, um, for the questions. So, uh, with that, let me just say uh, goodbye to everyone, and again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.